Seldom is there a mech which would evolve into something so feared, even if irrationally so. There is a lumbering figure that would emerge, with snapping pincers and a dread-inspiring appearance as the ground trembles with each of its steps during the Star League. A design called for by Alexander Kerensky himself, though not as successful or popular as its spiritual cousin, the Atlas. This beast would inspire fear in its own way, and would see itself crush the opposition put before it. Literally designed to fulfill Kerensky's wishes by the same organization which built the legendary Crab battle mech, this monster is seen as its larger brother for obvious reasons. Without further delay, for fear this beast may grab hold of us, let us begin to dissect the history and function of Kasara Weaponry's Kaiju, the King Crab. An assault mech weighing in at 100 tons, the King Crab is the heaviest tonnage bracket available for a mech, barring the questionable super heavy designs that would begin to appear much later. Corsara would work with Alexander Kerensky's guidelines to build a true terror after receiving the Star League's request in 2741. Though the design would be successful in its own right, its role seemed to change and the overall numbers of mechs produced declined in comparison to its more famous stablemate, the Atlas. This is mostly linked to its specialized capabilities, with the King Crab being a short-term battering ram rather than an endurance all-around fighter and command mech that the Atlas appeared to be. The King Crab's lack of endurance would be a nagging issue for the design, outside of variants built for the royal units of the Star League for centuries. Alexander Kerensky's guidelines were very simple for Kosara when it came to the mighty crab-shaped vehicle, which was, in his words, to cripple a mech in a single salvo. The King Crab would do just that as it was tested by the SLDF in a series of war games and training exercises sometime after it walked off the assembly line in 2743. Unfortunately for this crab, given the late date of its arrival, the King Crab would only see a few decades of uninterrupted production, which in comparison to more venerable designs such as the Highlander, meant it would never be seen in the kind of numbers that many of its peers were, especially as the production and popularity never matched that of the Atlas, much to some mech warrior's chagrin. Due to its more recent nature and its specialized role, we're not sure if every single SLDF division or regiment would have had a selection of King Crabs. This battering ram approach meant that the King Crab would be deployed by the SLDF in areas to knock through heavy defenses, and most certainly would not see deployment in anything that looked like maneuver warfare. Even then, however, its autocannons would face a serious flaw in its most common configuration for the Star League, as it would run dry of ammunition very quickly, and this can and would leave the King Crab in a precarious position. This flaw in the design, though, by and large, was never corrected, at least at the time of the Ameris Civil War, barring the Royal Variant. One thing that often goes unsaid is after Richard Cameron's assassination, personally at the hands of the usurper Stefan Ameris, many of the facilities that produced arms for the SLDF now produced arms for what was being called the Ameris Empire, and the King Crab was no different. Though it is worth noting that Kassara's facilities on Mars, which had produced the King Crab, were destroyed by Terran forces during the opening of the coup, leaving only its facilities on Northwind within Ameris's grasp. As a result, this immense monstrosity, like many other designs, would be seen on both sides as the SLDF slugged it out with the Rimworld's army in the years of devastating wars which saw countless millions dying in the heinous collateral damage of the Ameris Civil War. In service of the SLDF, the King Crab would survive the Civil War, despite the horrors of real conflict being seen by many designs like the King Crab for the first time. When the Great Exodus came in the aftermath as the Defense Forces departed the Inner Sphere after the complete destruction of the Terran Heartland, 
the king crab would leave in such numbers that an already rare mech became an oddity. Worse still, both of Kosara's facilities were destroyed, which produced the king crab. The facilities on Northwind were made completely inoperable in regards to king crab production, and during the Amer Civil War, where its facilities on Mars were destroyed, this meant that they could not produce them either. The latter would be repaired by Comstar, but would not export them to any power until after the clan invasion. The king crab is viewed as the ultimate sledgehammer, a machine that breaks through the hardest of mechs and the hardest of points, lumbering in the distance as a foreboding sign of doom. Its reputation is well earned, and this mech's existence would have far-reaching consequences. The King Crab series of battle mechs have several noteworthy features from its original design, which are passed on through the ages regardless of variant. Kassara Weapons didn't entirely believe that the King Crab, as a 100-ton monster, was going to just be a mauler and brawler that strode up the field with its teeth gnashing, fighting hard from the front in the entirety of its lifespan. And as a result, the King Crab has the Command Mech attribute in its advanced rules. This is specifically related to its Dalban Comline communication system in the original Star League design and is considered to be state of the art, as well as at the bleeding edge of what most mechs could carry in 2741, the time of the conceptualization and finalized design of the King Crab. Though later models, in particular its downgrade, would shed these systems, all variants of the King Crab at this time still have the command mech trait. In order to back this up, in order to coordinate, and in order to help its vital autocannons find their targets, it also has the follow-up system in the form of the Dalban Hi-Res B targeting and tracking system, another excellent high-quality device to fulfill this purpose. Another fascinating note is that the King Crab series used to have the no torso twist quirk in the advanced rules, due to its older artwork and design. Because of the new artwork being put forward, and because developers as a whole have soured on the no torso twist rule, for very obvious in tabletop game reasons, this quirk was recently removed from the King Crab, meaning that its enemies have even more to fear from it. The first variant of the King Crab to reach full production is the KGC-000. This is what Kerensky had asked for in his original request, and it was mostly delivered on, even if it had some extremely dangerous shortcomings. It's imperative to make clear, many battle mechs during the Star League era may have had access to more sophisticated technology, but most production lines didn't use this, at least in the original lore, until Technical Readout 3058, and some of the Royal variants being revealed later. Nonetheless, this is a subject for another time. As an outcome, it does use some Lost Tech technologies, but not much. The King Crab is powered by a 19-ton Velar 300 Fusion standard engine, giving it a maximum speed of 54 kilometers per hour, or 5 movement points in the tabletop game. Not only does this engine weigh as much as a light mech, but when installed in a 60-ton mech, for instance, it provides it with a maximum speed of 86 km per hour. This is an exceedingly powerful power plant. It's just once it gets in a machine as large as the KGC series, even this mighty engine, which in and of itself is only one ton shy of being the weight of a locust, can only do so much. Five movement points is not particularly impressive in terms of its tabletop capabilities for movement but it's at least functional, and that is all the King Crab needs given its size and weight. It can't keep up with mainline units moving 64 kilometers per hour, but it does keep up with breakthrough formations and assault mech formations, which move more commonly at 54 kilometers per hour. The KGC-000 sticks with conventional heat sinks for this design, rather than opting for the more traditionally expensive double heat sink mechanisms seen in other models. As a consequence, it comes with 15 total heat sinks, contributing 5 extra tons to its cooling. This is done for several reasons. To start with, it's a ballistics-based mech, which means it shouldn't be generating too much heat anyway, and because its ranges are heavily bracketed. Fighting in close, even while walking, it will break even on its heat values. Fighting at long ranges, the results are very similar. 
What this means, however, is that even though typically an Alpha Strike would be undesirable for the King Crab to do regardless, the Triple O cannot safely Alpha Strike all of its weapons. Where the King Crab shines is in the realm of firepower. In theory. To begin with, inside of its protective armored pincers lay the true source of its strength, and potentially the source of all of its troubles, in that it has twin Death Giver autocannons, classified as AC-20s. These cannons do traumatic damage for their era, giving the King Crab some of the best burst damage of any battle mech in the history of the setting, and most definitely in the Inner Sphere's arsenal during 2750, through to the initial Clan Invasion's technical readouts, barring some late arrivals that were inserted artificially into these eras. When both of these cannons make their target, each has a chance to outright destroy their opponent should they hit a vital system, such as the head. Even when they don't, they shred plating very quickly and rapidly leave their victims simply exposed to critical hits from other sources, or literally hammer the target until its destruction. There is only one problem. The King Crab has five turns worth of fire. After this, it only has its backup weapons to rely on. It really is very niche in its original form as a result. Extremely deadly to targets which cannot avoid these cannon blasts, most definitely, but something which can be managed or even overwhelmed by lighter skirmisher designs, especially if they can overextend the King Crab and force it to expend its invaluable AC-20 rounds either into the wrong target or targets that cannot be easily hit. To back up these Death Givers, the Triple O comes with a Simpson 15 LRM Launcher, or LRM 15, which is mounted in its left torso, as well as its only energy weapon, the Exostar Large Laser, which is in its right torso. The LRM 15 system is effective, but also suffers from having only one ton of ammunition. Worse still, this ammunition is also comically placed in its center torso, weakening the King Crab slightly by potentially making this a vulnerability that might destroy the vehicle from an unlucky ammunition strike. While the King Crab's weapons are terrifying, and they are, they have a very clear weakness, which is that there is very minimal endurance to this vehicle. It needs to fight, and win, in the first half of any conflict, as it may not be armed enough for an extended brawl. While not as heavily defended as its more famous peer, the Atlas, the King Crab is heavily fortified against incoming fire with a staggering 16 tons of ferrofibrous armor plating, giving it 287 points of outer protection. This is, in terms of its physical frame, its most technologically advanced trait. In addition to this, more than sufficient armoring, the Triple O comes with twin cases for its AC-20 munitions, meaning that should there be an unexpected breach into the torso, the mech as a whole is likely to survive an ammunition explosion within the side torso, just not its center torso where the LRM missiles are placed. Still, its armor allows it to act as a battering ram, which is exactly what it was designed for. The KGC-000 is a fantastically dangerous weapons platform in the right hands, and in the right surroundings, but also cannot escape its deficiencies in some regards. Its advantages are best displayed against other slow-moving combatants, in hopes that its thunderous autocannons can be put to good use. But there is a very unique circumstance, and should the King Crab find itself against targets which can evade or obscure its tremendous fire, it simply doesn't have the rounds to spend to keep the enemy at bay, especially multiple fast adversaries. Nevertheless, it is meant to be a component in an entire lance or company, but the KGC-000 may find itself on the sidelines, simply trying to wait for the moment to act, something that may never happen, and much to the calamitous end for its fellow lancemates. This is one of the reasons why the KGC became less popular than the Atlas, despite its incredible upfront firepower. The King Crab might even be able to knock out an Atlas under the right conditions. But it cannot weather the storm in the ways its more famous cousin can. Though it was not manufactured in huge numbers, at least comparatively to some of the other mechs which fill the same tonnage slot, 
the king crab was still produced enough and wanted by the right units enough to see itself spread to at least some portions of the SLDF. When it came to the royal divisions of the organization, though, there would be a desire to see this battle mech enter service with more elite formations. Some of these would be modified to the elite unit standards and would be refit and produced as the KGC-00B, the Royal Variant. Wanting the original mech's performance, but more endurance and reliability, and without cost being a concern, the Royal units would install double heat sinks into the mech and would reduce its overall heat sink total to 12, giving it 24 heat sinking ability. With three extra tons available, they would install two more tons of AC-20 ammunition, as well as upgrading its LRM-15 to an Artemis enhanced LRM-15. All of these changes would mean that the King Crab does become more versatile in terms of its heat management. But more importantly, it can spend its ammunition either more liberally in short engagements, or it can hold out for longer and more protracted conflicts before needing a resupply. During the Star League, these would be considered the peak King Crabs in the Star League Defense Forces. Impressively, as an aside, there was another little known design at the time, the KGC-010. While this piggybacks off the Star League's design with Corsara, the Terran military, the hegemony armed forces, opted to see this introduced in their own ranks as a command mech and thus secretly spoke with Kosara about radically redesigning the King Crab to fit this template. This design would come into production, and would be fielded by the Terrans, though they would find themselves more often fielded by the Usurper in the Inner Sphere more than anyone else, unfortunately. All remaining examples of this machine left with the Star League Defense Forces during the Exodus, after the Ameris Civil War. It maintains the same engine, though it does install endo steel in its frame in order to save five full tons of weight. Its heat sinks are switched for double heat sinks and left with 10 standard doubles, giving it 20 sinking capacity overall. In addition, its armor is upgraded to 19 full tons, putting it on par with the Atlas. The most radical departure is its offensive capabilities. All the original components are removed. In each of its claws, instead, rests an LB-10X autocannon, and each is fed with three tons of ammunition, meaning that this mech is very much a distance fighter. In addition, it carries a pair of particle projection cannons in its torso, which fire a strangely colored variant of the attack out of its oddly shaped barrels, giving it hard hitting abilities at range. Finally, it has twin SRM-6 launchers for even more blistering scatter damage. This incarnation of the mech peels back armor at long range using its Hellstar PPCs and sandblasts its targets with twin LBXs as well, or some combination of these two systems as it relentlessly crawls forward towards its targets. Once things come to short range encounters, the sand blasting intensifies, with the LBX cannons being supplemented further by streams of SRM missiles. This warrior for the Terran military, and only for the Terran military for the most part, is a true demon on the field of battle. It can punch holes through armor with particle cannon shots, and then simply shotgun targets until they slowly are washed away like a sandcastle fighting waves on the shore. Almost any mech warrior who needs to face this down faces a near certain doom. After the destruction of so much of the Terran hegemony in the Ameris Civil War, the Succession Wars would scorch much of the rest of the Inner Sphere in a series of destructive campaigns, and the King Crab's facilities would be among the first victims in 2786 as Northwind was pillaged during the opening conflicts that would send the Inner Sphere back by centuries. With the only production facility left under Comstar, there would be almost nothing to trickle into the Inner Sphere to service the already uncommon King Crab models, and they would be further depleted almost immediately in the war itself, as the intensity of the conflict took a heavy toll on the remaining King Crabs and their pilots during this era. 
But this isn't to say that they were unseen. Comstar's quiet forces from time to time may appear in these mechs when they dared to venture out, or mercenaries affiliated with them, but they were exceptionally uncommon. Those that were found, or fought, would become the stuff of folklore and legend, as mech warriors were pitted against a machine not seen in decades or centuries in a desperate bid to survive. What few models remained became de facto downgrades over time, and I'm not even sure Kosara weapons would have even produced anything like a refit package for the dwindling machines from this time. But there is a designation for what would be the downgrade for the King Crabs as they fell from grace during the Succession Wars. Unlike some of their peers like the Highlander, it found no true home out of Comstar during this age. The KGC Quadruple Zero is the designation for the rough, approximate design of what the King Crab was after the loss of so much technology and the loss of what allowed it to support its high-tech armor. These machines were still broadly King Crabs, more specifically Triple Zero variants in their functionality from the perspective of their heat sinks and weapons, but would start to drift in terms of their armor and onboard systems. The advanced Dalban comline was stripped out in favor of its more primitive counterpart, the Dalban Virtue Tech, reducing its effectiveness as a commander, but it still has the command mech quirk. Outside of this, the King Crab would remove its case systems and ferrofibrous armor. The saved weight from the cases was put back into the armor, giving it 17 tons of standard plating, conferring to it 272 defensive points. Beyond that, the Quadruple O is essentially a Triple O. While not wholly extinct, the King Crab would be all but gone, and the Quadruple Zero is the shadow that would remain inside the Inner Sphere. The SLDF in Exile would retain much of their technology and much of their battle mechs when they went into the Deep Night, heading towards their fate in the Pentagon Worlds and Kerensky Cluster. During a time where this model had essentially become extinct in the Inner Sphere, it would be a part of the clans at their birth, as Nicholas Kerensky mutated the people of the former Star League into his new society. Where its most infamous role would play out would be the destruction of Clan Wolverine. A trial of refusal was waged between Clan Wolverine's con Sarah McKevity and her saw con Dwight Robertson against the ill con himself, Nicholas Kerensky, regarding a cache of weapons and equipment found on Wolverine territory, where Kerensky opted to distribute its contents by trial to various clan forces. This trial of refusal launched by Sarah had to do with her personal attachment to the contents, being that of her father's division and because it was on Wolverine territory, as well as some of the bad blood that had been fueled with the fall of the Pentagon Worlds and the jealousy and envy directed towards Clan Wolverine. Sarah would take her guillotine into battle, while Robertson would take his Black Knight, two excellent mech warriors with excellent machines. Clan Widowmaker had earned the right to face off against the two of them, and would be sent into the field in a pair of King Crab battle mechs, whose forms were imposing to the two cons even upon their sight, despite knowing that the Widowmaker con was not within. What resulted from this trial was a brutal engagement, with the King Crabs reigning victorious over the more experienced, better mech warriors in the form of Clan Wolverine's leadership. Their hulking frames were too much, and their firepower was such that they simply tore apart the battle mechs of these brave combatants. In the trial, Dwight would be killed, and Sarah would be grievously wounded, with both of their mechs being made inoperable. Only with the intervention of Kerensky himself did Sarah's life pass to the other side of this trial intact. This was Widowmaker's greatest victory against their rivals in Clan Wolverine and it would set in motion the destruction of Clan Wolverine, as well as leading to the events that eventually saw the death of the leader of Clan Widowmaker, and beyond that even later, even his clan, as well as Nicholas Kerensky. And all this was done by the claws of two King Crabs, 
Their victory, perhaps more than any other, is the peak of the King Crab's influence in the history of the clans, whether they know it or not. The succession wars would come to an end, with the last major conflict of them being the War of 3039. Even if another conflict seemed to be brewing at the time of the clan invasion, it amounted to nothing, as the clan invasion would be so catastrophic and calamitous that the Inner Sphere would respond, like a wounded animal by an attack, viciously and desperately. The Sphere would rally around this event. The clan invaders not only destroyed people's ways of life, something rarely done within the planets when they changed hands in the Inner Sphere, but they also seemed unstoppable. Even as the progress of the invasion slowed as they grew ever closer to their ultimate prize, Terra, it was uncertain if they could be stopped. Comstar, the rulers of the Soul System and masters of the communication grid across the Inner Sphere, aimed to see the advance halted. Another organization which descended from the Star League, though not as advanced as the clans, Comstar would offer the clans a challenge on the world of Tukiid. On this world, the clan invaders would square off against one of the most sophisticated forces in the Inner Sphere, with many in their ranks being superbly trained, and many who were just as fanatical as the clans themselves. In fact, there are several variants of various mechs that were given the title Clan Buster. The one that perhaps stands out the most is that of the King Crab. Though largely unseen on the battlefields of the Inner Sphere while fighting against the clans, a rude awakening would appear for them. With some being refit and others remaining their original configuration, a major contributor to the falls of the clans on Tukiid would be the reborn King Crab the most vicious of the clan busters perhaps fielded against these foes. At the end of Tukiid, the clans were tired and vanquished, and standing tall were the calm guard. But it also has to be said that the King Crab's frame perhaps stood tallest that day, sharing only a bit of space with the vaunted Black Knight. The KGC-001 would be the official designation for what would be referred to simply as the King Crab Clan Buster. Designed with input from one of the best military minds of their time, Frederick Steiner, also known as Anastius Falkt, the presenter marshal of Comstar and the Comguards, this configuration was built to be as competitive with clan designs as possible, and most certainly was. The Clan Buster used several advanced technologies available to Comstar to maximize its effectiveness against the clans. To start with, it would install a 300XL fusion engine, which may have reduced some of its survivability, but resulted in significant weight savings which were put into weapon systems. To add further to compensate for this, it would expand upon its feral fibers to harden the machine by going to 16.5 tons, making it have 295 points of protection, almost claiming the same total as the Atlas. It would use standard heat sinks, but this largely wouldn't impact its performance due to its choice of weapons on board, and it has a sinking capacity of 13 overall. The parade of devastating weapons on board was extreme, and would earn this model a terrifying reputation. To start with, it has a pair of M7 Gauss rifles, replacing out its old AC-20 systems. These rifles have over twice the distance of its original autocannons, and it has 16 rounds of ammunition each. The reason for this installation was simple. Extra range, but still a major damage output. Each shot is still powerful enough to rip the head clean off their clan counterparts, no matter the technology they had on board at the time, and even striking other locations would be a severe shock to any mech, clan or otherwise. These cannons also generated almost no heat, meaning that the mech can fire these systems with almost no worry every time they have an opportunity. Gauss rifles have the same range, heat generation, and damage, whether they are Inner Sphere or Clan, so this weapon was an ideal choice to make a dedicated anti-Clan variant. 
No clanners knew of these change systems either, as among their own king crabs, they'd never bothered with anything like these variants in any kind of mainstream configuration. Those that engaged units equipped with these were caught off guard extremely quickly, and many were devastated and destroyed by this Goss-centric design. To add further, it retains its LRM package, which acts as a long-range add-on to its Gauss rifle and upgrades its large laser to a more accurate and hard-hitting large pulse laser. Finally, a pair of SRM-2 streaks are given in an attempt to add more close-range survivability, given the Clan Buster's minimum range penalties on its Gauss rifles. The Clan Buster lived up to its name. In the legendary Battle of Tukiad, it matched many clan mechs shot for shot, and when used in ambush or in support, it was even more overpowering. This radical redesign would be used as the basis for many other assault mechs moving forward afterwards, using the data from this battle to help understand optimal battle mech production to fight clanners. Mechs like the Gunslinger and Cerberus, as well as others, would mirror this design by realizing that Gauss rifles were a major equalizer with their clan counterparts. After the Battle of Tukiat itself, the Clan Buster would be allowed for export by Comstar, meaning that these would end up in the hands of House Lords, as well as mercenary units, as despite the victory on Tukiad, in no small part on the ground being a victory by the King Crab, the battle against the clans had not yet been resolved, and would not see a long peace until after the destruction of Clan Smoke Jaguar. Though the King Crab would see itself made available to other manufacturers through espionage during what is known as the Fedcom Civil War era, the breakup of the once enormous and mighty Federated Commonwealth, the model we are going to focus on now comes from an era whose name is related to religious warfare, and what I typically refer to to the YouTube's algorithm as the Blakist era. The Word of Blake a breakaway group of Comstar, would set the Inner Sphere alight in an inferno that would be almost as calamitous as the Succession Wars. They had infiltrated the Free Worlds League through Thomas Hallis and successfully took Terra and the surrounding systems for themselves, all in a bid to claim the reborn Star League to enact their prophecy. Instead, the Star League dissolved just as they were about to become members of it. With their prophecy undone, they would launch a crusade against the Inner Sphere and clans alike. And that would end with the destruction of countless millions of lives. Nuclear weapons and strange, almost alien mech designs cluttered fields in their desperate attempt to exact their revenge upon the world, as well as to rebuild a new Star League from the ashes left behind. They would be stopped and now are considered to be one of the most hated organizations in the history of Battletech, at least by the Inner Sphere. Though perhaps the clans may also vie for this role, and they still have time to acquire yet more contempt. But during this time, they would use their factories on Mars to produce the mighty King Crab once more, and in their own twisted image. The KGC-008 would be a mech redesign with the use of the latest technologies available to the Word of Blake at the time, and something which in many ways mirrored what the Clan Buster had been, only with an eye on making it a non-ammunition design. Sadly, Kosara achieved this for their Blakest masters. Installing endo steel to the internal structure was done in order to save weight, though an eye was given to try to achieve more durability in the design in many respects, and an XL engine was considered unnecessary. Thus, the 008 goes back to the traditional Fusion 300 engine as well. A heavy-duty gyro is installed, making this core component more durable, though at the expense of more weight. With its new weapons in mind, attention was then focused on increasing its heat sinking abilities, for which it has a total of 17 double heat sinks to manage, in other words giving it 34 sinking capacity, making it run very cool, which it has to given its very hot weapons payload. Also, fascinatingly, it was given the ability to jump, 
as it has jump juts installed, letting it reposition in dense terrain and enhancing its defensive abilities in many ways. To help it remain elusive, which is strange for a king crab, it also installs a guardian ECM suite as well. As if all of that weren't enough, it has 19.5 tons of standard armor, making it even more armored than its cousin, the Atlas. The final component in this nightmarish concoction which is on board is an improved C3 computer, allowing it to network with other Blakist units to enhance its abilities to hit targets through its networking and to share its own target data with others as well. Looking to focus primarily on systems that aren't ammunition dependent, the Word of Blake would install a pair of heavy PPCs as the primary systems behind its massive claws. Each one of these hits as hard as a clan ER PPC, and has the potential to strip the head off a mech in a single blow. They punch holes in armor just as their Gauss rifle predecessors, and the extra heat sinks were installed to compensate for these. Able to carve opponents at range with these cannons, it cannot be overstated just how dangerous this pair of weapons can be at both weakening or coring an enemy mech. It can literally take smaller machines apart in a few salvos, and it has no ammunition to worry about while doing it. Its secondary systems are a pair of ER medium lasers for striking back up close, and a pair of light AC2s to harass enemy mechs, vehicles, and aircraft. With its heavy gyro, extremely heavy armor, and no XL engine, the KGC-008 mirrors much of what the Seraphim mechs would look like as well making itself intensely durable and hard to permanently knock out of action. The addition of an ECM and jump jets only adds to its collection of survivable, deadly features it possesses. The addition of an ECM and jump jets only adds to this collection of survivable, deadly features, and this doesn't even touch on its heavy PPCs, which can fire so long as the mech is still standing, especially while it's networked with other Blakist machines feeding it targeting information. While it is an imperfect design in some ways as well, and potentially lacks some firepower in small ways, it's intensely hard to knock out, and it is still lethal enough to duel the best of the assault class. This monster would fight on behalf of the Blakist cause until the very end, until the inevitable crusade came to an end, and Terra was liberated from the psychotic ideology of the word of Blake. The Republic of the Sphere was formed in the aftermath of the horrendous destruction of the Word of Blake's incursion, taking up much of what had been the old Terran hegemony. While peace would reign, for the most part, for some years, internal divisions in this new great state in the center of the Inner Sphere would eventually spread into larger and larger conflicts, both inside itself and its neighbors. This would culminate with its destruction, but tragically also would result in yet more conflict everywhere in human space. Comstar too would not survive this era. During these conflicts, some king crabs would take on a new appearance when produced at certain facilities or times, having a radically different look, but the same structure beneath. The king crab mostly finds its home being produced in three locations as of the latest age, which is once again Northwind, Mars, and Sunhoya. Each one of these produces a wider range of variants for different clients. The latest model is the Martian model, from its original manufacturer, Kosara. Its designation is the KGC-001, with the conquest of the Soul System by Clan Wolf, though, and the rebirth of the new Clan Star League, the fate of this particular design's manufacturing is unknown though there are some great inner sphere powers that still possess this design. The remnants of the Republic of the Sphere, the Lyran Commonwealth, and the Capellan Confederation are those who deploy the bleeding edge of carcinization. A Herculean machine, the KGC-011, completely changes the overall design behind the King Crab's internal systems. It is so different, in fact, that it might be alien to what you would consider to be a king crab. 
This new generation of 100-ton monster is not powered by its traditional 300 VLR Fusion Standard engine, or its 300XL engine upgrade. Instead, the 011 is powered by an immense 400XXL Fusion engine, giving it a maximum speed of 64 km per hour, or 6 movement points in the tabletop game. Only this gets more intense than one might imagine, as this Goliath also has a supercharger on board, allowing the King Crab to reach a maximum speed of 86 km per hour, or 8 movement points in the tabletop game. This makes the King Crab have bursts of speed which can compete with the average movement of fast heavies and medium mechs. It takes this once lumbering lobster and turns it into a swift hunter, as it tries to close in on range to deliver its deadly payload. Though of course, it does pay the price of having an Inner Sphere XXL engine to do all this. This 100 ton carcinizated assault mech has a very familiar weapon set, but it results in it needing a heatsink capacity much higher than many of its ammunition based variants. It installs 6 double heatsinks in order to give it a total of 32 heatsinking capacity. In terms of the aforementioned weaponry, the KGC-011 focuses in many ways on replicating much of what the original design was. To start with, hidden behind those armored claws, lays twin LB-20X autocannons, each one with three full tons of ammunition to fire from. These rounds, as a default, are set to be cluster-based munitions, sandblasting targets with potentially 40 scattering pellets every turn, but it can be switched out for other ammunition types, such as solid projectiles, emulating the original AC-20s the King Crab came with only with a longer range of up to 12 hexes instead of 9 hexes. Typically staying in the realm of cluster ammunition, this is a crit-seeking monster, either striking cockpits with multiple rounds or shredding into internal systems with through armor criticals. And that is to say nothing of the volumes of damage that this thing can push out. Backing up these two systems, one would be a Rocket 15, a simple weapon that fires only once. The other would be a far more versatile and dangerous plasma rifle, which is able to obliterate vehicles and infantry with ease, as well as scorch into and past armor plating on battle mechs. This combination of weapons makes the 011 extremely dangerous as a combatant, and not something that could ever be ignored. Much like the other recent models of the King Crab, its armored protection is enhanced, giving it a full 19.5 tons of standard armor plating, making it incredibly difficult to breach into, and protecting its extremely vulnerable internal systems, like its XXL engine and ammunition. Every single available critical space inside of this particularly enormous crab is taken up as well, meaning any critical hits to any areas of the mech can and will have a negative impact on its performance somewhere. Everything is vital inside of this machine. Fast, heavily armored, and heavily armed, the KGC-011 is the king crab for a new era. This crab doesn't awkwardly waddle up the field, it awkwardly waddles up the field at high speed. While not excessively well armed, per se, it's well armed enough to put just about any opposing mech into the ground, and even against other assault mechs, might just have bursts of speed that allow it to simply run past its original target and obliterate them from behind with a back attack. Using Torso Twist, of course, which is a terrifying prospect but it is vulnerable to critical hits in a real way, with so much of the mech being truly vital systems which can be knocked out should it take any internal damage. All the same, the king is dead. Long live the king. What can one say? The king crab is truly one of the greats. In its original form, it has a series of deep flaws which prevented it from becoming as prevalent as the atlas but it was always a foreboding and terrifying form to see lurk its way onto the battlefield. It evolved from there into the peak of the original clan busters, and then into the vanguard of the word of Blake. Other states would use it as well, and gain access to it through facilities in the latter half of the 31st century, but this behemoth would always be something to be feared across the ages. Finally, it would evolve into the Dark Age and Ilkhan killer we see now. 
a machine with no home potentially after Alaric Ward's conquest of Terra, but one that still lumbers forward for multiple states and may soon find its way into a series of battles yet. Once this mech came out of its shell in the newer eras of warfare, it proved it is far more than its original designers could have imagined. Perhaps it even goes on to prove that carcinization is true, as the King Crab will destroy all mechs that stand before it. And one day all shall become Crab. Thank you for joining me here today. It was a real pleasure to cover the King Crab, as it's just such a unique and recognizable design in the history of Battletech, and it has such an important place within it. I'd just like to give a special thanks to Battlebound Gaming for letting me use one of the bigger shots during this video in regards to the clan invasion, as well as Astray for illustrating it for him and also giving me permission to use it in this video. Links to their respective channels and sites are in the description below. I'd also like to thank all of the YouTube members who support this channel, as this content is only possible because of viewers like you. With that, I will catch everyone in the comment section below.